Welcome to the uh, R4DS Project Club. This is our third meeting. And uh, Tanache is going to show us how to build dynamic resumes. Take it away. Awesome. Um, actually, before I do that, um, you know, the craziest thing just happened to me. Um, you know, 45 seconds ago, I might have met my dream employer. Just 45 seconds ago. It's crazy. Um, and they said that they might be able to give me my dream job. Um, but I have to do it by 2 p.m. today. But then I realized that I'm presenting during this meeting. It's crazy. Um, doesn't that ever, doesn't that ever happen to anybody? It's just the worst. So I'm gonna do something really quickly. I'm gonna just go in and uh, check on my resume. Um sorry guys, I know I'm supposed to be presenting right now. I just need to do this really quickly. Um Let's see. Yeah, everything was good. Blah 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 blah. Uh huh. Um, oh, wait a second. There's something missing. I am actually a mentor at R for Data Science. I need to. I need to add that to my resume. I'm not going to do this. I don't have Microsoft Word on this computer. It's not even like I can edit a PDF, can I? Um, you know what? I know what I'll do. I'll ask GitHub to do it. Okay. Just add it into my CSV here. That's saved. And um, go. Um, let's see. Maybe I can just really quickly. Hmm. Yeah, that should work. Okay. Now I'm going to do the presentation. Sorry to take up your time, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So. To get started, um, if, uh, any, if everybody here could uh, just really quickly um, uh, scan this QR code and head into this uh, survey here, um, because this survey is going to give us a little bit of data to talk about, about where people are in their, um, uh, in their, in their career pots on their survey, on their, um, when it comes to your resume. That's the survey right there. I'm going to keep it open for you there. And I'll start the poll. Uh, so the first question is about where you are in your career journey. Um, you could be just a baby or you're looking for your first position. You feel like maybe you're starting to set up your career or you're fully established. You might be in senior management or you might have even retired. Um, so I'm here. Let me give five seconds for the next survey. Three, two, one. And next question. Mm -hmm. Question two, how often do you update your resume or CV? Get five more seconds for that. How much time do you spend updating your resume or CV? And the last question, how much do you agree with the following statement? Um, working on my resume is a simple task. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop it right there. Open up the results. Okay. So <laughs> um, the first question, where would you say you are in your career journey? 50% of people said I'm just a baby. 
Um, twenty five percent said I'm looking for my first position, and twenty five percent said I'm just setting up my career. Okay, that's uh, that's good. Um, let's see. Um, how often do you update your resume? CV once a month, every six months, once a year, only when someone asks me to. Um, you could see me doing that last one just now. Um, <laughs> And question three, how much time do you spend updating your resume CV? Uh, 10, to, 10 to 30 minutes, one person answered that, and 30 minutes to an hour, um, two people. So 30 minutes to an hour seems pretty reasonable. Um, <laughs> and agreeing with the following statement, working on my resume is a simple task. Only three, three people say that they disagree with that. And um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, one person said that they agree. I don't know who such a crazy person is. I'm kidding. Um, but I, I totally agree. Like most of the time working on a resume or a CV is just annoying. And this presentation is all about why. Um, so part one, I hate Microsoft. I really do. And all of their products most of the time. Um, so people are already asking themselves, why, why would you hate Microsoft? Everybody uses it. And I give you here the examples. Tables never do what they're supposed to do. Um, pointers never point to the thing you're supposed to point to. And everything just seems to break in ways that you just don't expect and you don't really want to happen, especially when you're working on a deadline or you're working in uh, a high stress scenario. Um, the reason for this is that Microsoft Word is what's called a WYSIWYG. Um, what you see is what you get. Um, when people were coming up with different applications for computers, um, you know, back in like the 80s, especially around <laughs> the 80s with the early Apple Macs and stuff, um, there was a there was a realization that there was a disconnect between a computer user and a computer engineer. You know, computer engineers were people who were writing code to make computers do stuff. But, um, you know, they were eventually, they eventually realized that, like, you got to write um, applications that people can use that don't need to be coded. Um, they don't need to be, you know, uh, dealt with in, a, in an engineering manner and an engineering mindset. And so they developed uh, different types of programs for, uh, for creating documents. And what they did is they put the typesetting, like what the actual page is going to look like and the composition, as in the content of the page, into one thing. They put it into one application. Um, and this is this has been great. Like, it's a worldwide phenomenon that everybody knows how to use Microsoft Word or its, comp or its competitions. Um, and, you know, that's, that's awesome, but it has limitations. And I'm going to talk about some of the limitations here. Um, the first one is that there's too many features at once. Um, a lot of the time, you're, like, you're trying to edit a document and, you know, I've had situations where, you know, like I demonstrated in those GIFs earlier, the tables just don't align, right? That's a simple thing that, you know, you think that, you know, a table should just like snap to a certain place in the page, but it just doesn't. Um, or sometimes because uh, different characters are hidden in Microsoft, you don't know where page breaks are and you don't know where paragraph breaks are. And sometimes the bullet indentations go all over the place. You don't know where those actual characters are and to find those characters and delete them is pain. Um, whereas um, text editors that we're all familiar with from using RStudio, for example, are just text editors. You have to deliberately install more features if you want it to do more things, right? Um, you can actually see this in the most recent RStudio build or positive or I guess it's an RStudio product, it's RStudio build. The most recent RStudio build has a button that you can click that says, do you want it to be a WYSIWYG visual editor or do you want just the editor for text? And in order to have those WYSIWYG features, you have to deliberately install them. Um, so obviously this doesn't apply to every scenario, right? This is a keynote presentation and it looks fantastic. Um, but if you don't need fill, frills and fluff, and fancy stuff that you, that looks nice. <laughs> if you need literate programming, which is something that most of us are doing, if you need reproducibility and automation, and if you need to focus on the content, then you shouldn't really be using a WYSIWYG editor. You should separate out your typesetting and your, comp and your uh, composition. So for example, a lot of note-taking apps right now are moving to 
offer a feature called focus or distraction free or whatever, uh, where they basically just take off the, 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 the bars that have all of your um, fancy features and plugs and stuff like that. <laughs> and they just give you a page and the page is, is just where you type. Um, and that's been uh, something that I've seen growing in all sorts of different um, fields and for all sorts of different apps. Um, if you want to see an example of what I mean, um, you can scan this QR code and open up this website. I didn't put it on here um, because the website does contain file language, um, as some <laughs> computer scientists tend to do. Um, but it's really funny if you're tolerant of that kind of language. Um, so please have fun with that. Um, it's, a, it's basically an example of, of how like simple a website should really be if you take away all the frills and fluff that comes with, you know, uh, you know, WordPress and uh, Squarespace and all of these things that try to make it look fancy. A website can be really simple. And as long as it's simple, it's more effective. Um, but let's take a second to go back to this idea of literate programming. Um, if you've never heard of the term, um, it was uh, coined by this uh, Stanford uh, professor named Donald Nuff, um, who said literature programming is a methodology that combines a programming language with a documentation language to make programs more robust, more portable, more easily maintained, um, and arguably more fun to write than programs that are written in like a high level language. Um, and I, I completely agree. I think the, the best thing that happened to me um, was learning that R provides R markdown because it drastically reduced my programming anxiety. I would, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever, you know, opened a new language for the first time in an IDE that they've never heard of, that they've never seen before, and that doesn't come with like a tutorial or anything, and it's just a blank page, and you don't even know where to get started. The first time that most users come across R markdown, the document is actually loaded already with code example code and with explanation of that code and you can click run and it runs and you feel like a magician my program <laughs> anxiety was severely reduced by meeting our markdown in my opinion it's also faster to write uh code alongside your documentation um because you're less likely at least in the r ecosystem you're less likely to write things that don't make sense um it's almost always that you're you end up being um and equipped with the ability to uh, think about what you're going to uh, code first and then move on to actually writing what you're going to code. And in my opinion, it's also perfect for science, especially for data science, uh, where you want to answer questions. Um, a lot of people think of programmers as, um, you know, people who are just hacking away code, like, you know, building things forever. And maybe that's true of like web dev or for huge software engineering products. but for what we do in data science here, uh, most of it is asking and answering questions. And so having the narrative of your asking and answering of questions is, uh, my, in my opinion, one of the best parts about literate programming. And there are loads of examples, right? Um, even this random language I found called F Sharp, they have F Sharp scripts that you know emphasize commenting. Um, if you've used Jupyter Lab, you probably really love Jupyter Notebooks. Um, R Markdown, we should all be familiar with. And um, the most recent uh, uh, newcomer to the scene is seen as Quarto, um, which we do have um, a lot of support for in the R for Data Science IO. Um, mm -hmm. Slack site. So if you're new to this at all, um, you know, please hit hit up that um, that channel and ask questions. Um, okay, so part two. I hate resumes. I just do. <laughs> um, updating resumes is the worst thing. Um, they need to be personalized, you know, like, or let me put it this way. This is what my recruiters tell me. This is what people in college would tell me, um, you know, advisors and stuff. They need to be personalized for each and every single application so that you make sure you communicate the best way, um, you know, to that specific employer. Um, and sometimes that is just unreasonable. Um, you know, if you're if you're trying to find a job in your, in your new grad uh, days, especially if you're in academia, um, and you're trying to just find an internship, trying to find a summer job, trying to find a research application. Um, you're doing this over and over and over again. And if, as we mentioned, as we took in the poll, if that takes 30 minutes just to make one change to a resume for one, one um, 
potential employer, you're going to be doing this for hours and hours and hours at a time every week. Um, and the moment you fall behind, you know, the five minute task of trying to update your resume can easily become 45 minutes because now you have broken the table that was really perfectly summarizing everything. And so you need to now rethink where to place everything in the Word document. And all of a sudden, you have to update not one, not two, but three different bullet points. And now the bullet points don't fit on one page. So now you have to start taking out things from other places. It's a pain. It's an absolute pain. And then there's version control. I mean, if if you still don't understand the, the tempest that is version control, um, you know, please let me know. We can grab some coffee virtually and I will talk your ear off about it. Um, <laughs> but there's also <laughs> uh, templates. Um, Microsoft Word templates and other other products as well seem to want to offer templates for resume building, which is great, but really, I don't think so. Here's my old resume, right? I think it, or this is my old CV rather, a screenshot of uh, Microsoft Word in my old CV. I think it looks great. Like at the time, it was exactly what I needed to do what I needed to do, right? Um, but here's what that actually looks like. Each one of these sections was a table with either one or multiple columns, depending on which section it was in. Each one of them had to have ridiculous amounts of tab breaks um, and different um, end of line specifiers. And each one of these uh, would also require um, that each of the lines has a different formatting every single time. So you can't just copy one table and move it to the next section. Because as you saw in the first couple of GIFs, once you move something, the entire document breaks. Um, and this is my template. If you don't believe me, here's a Microsoft Word template that just comes out the box. It's the same thing. Weird breaks, weird uh, space uh, space um, separators, and weird tables all over the place, right? If you wanted to edit this to really look like what you wanted it to look like, you'd be here for 45 minutes to an hour, I'm sure. Um, so here's the solution. Um, you should modularize and automate your resume. Really, you really, really should. Um, if you haven't so far, I'm gonna show you how I did it. Um, and I'm gonna, and, and I'll do this in a way that I hope communicates the um, appreciation of your needs and your ultimate goals. I don't think that there is a one size fits all for this problem. I'm gonna say that like right out the gate. I'm not going to, advertise that I built a package that can do it all for you. I'm not either going to advertise that there is one person who has built a package that will do it all for you. I don't believe that that's true. Um, but what I do believe is that everyone uh, does have the ability to cherry pick the different tools that will make this uh, process uh, really easy to accomplish these two goals, modularization and automation. Okay, so here's the first part. Um, you have to have your data in a standard plain text format. It's easy to add to, it's easy to access, and it's output agnostic. So any data can be stored anywhere you want. I chose Google Sheets for myself in this scenario. Um, specifically, I chose Google Sheets because I can access Google Sheets on my phone. Um, so if any time I need to just like add a quick thing like that I just happen to remember, I can actually do that from my phone. You could go with something different. You could, for example, um, have a gist or a CSV that lives in your GitHub. You could have a CSV that lives just in Google Drive, for example. Um, you could have any number of, uh, you know, maybe Dropbox or iCloud or the or any of those solutions. The point is, you should have data that's easy to access that builds the content of your um, resume or CV or resume or CV system. Um, the next one is the programming language to parse the data. Obviously, we're R users here, so I've selected R. Um, why I love it, it's good at um, manipulating tables. It's super accessible. Um, and there are existing packages and ecosystems um, that exist for this specific task of building a resume or a CV, right? Um, so talking about that, the packages do already exist. Um, R Markdown and Knitter are existing um, frameworks for um, uh, knitting together, I use the word knitting together, uh, your code and your um, uh, narratives. 
And the package down and VTA packages are uh, two packages that build on that concept and provide you with uh, frameworks for building things that already look like um, resumes and CVs. So already like we're halfway there. If you were not interested in using package down and VTA, I wouldn't be surprised and I would actually encourage you to look into your own ways to build that resume slash CV. Um, because at the end of the day, what a resume or CV is, if we're using this framework, is just knitting data and narrative together and printing it out on the sheet, right? Most of us know how to do that with our markdown. Um, so when it comes to actually styling, your CV a resume, um, this is where you actually need to uh, add in something that we might not be super familiar with, um, which is the common styles language. It's not super hard to pick up, um, but it does take some time to learn. Um, but fortunately, um, with the previous packages, Vitae and um, uh, what was it called? Um, and Package Down, uh, they actually do provide the basics of uh, your uh, common styles language, your CSS. Um, so that you can basically just go in and edit what you need. You don't need to build your CSS um, styling from scratch, right? But um, whether or not you consider yourself, you know, artistic or talented with graphics, it's still super good to learn CSS. I think it's a good idea to have a basic understanding of how CSS works and um, why and, and why people choose to use it for styling, as opposed to just going into Microsoft Word and editing your files there. Um, so yeah, the last thing I'll say, it's finicky, but it is very, very flexible. In fact, it's it's the basis of what most um, graphics looks like today um, when it comes to programmatic, so web development and such. Um, so under the hood, what's driving all of this is LaTeX or LaTeX, however you choose to say it. Um, most of uh, what we do in R Markdown and Quarto, if you're using it to develop a PDF of any kind, you're probably using LaTeX. And you might not even know you're using LaTeX. But um, if you've ever typed in, you know, tiny tech colon colon install or whatever, you're using LaTeX. Um, and this is uh, sort of an intermediate stage uh, when it comes to uh, generating PDFs from code documents. Um, your code document usually goes from R Markdown to um, LaTeX and then from LaTeX to PDF. And so if any of you have been in higher level academia, you might be familiar with LaTeX because that's what most people use to generate scientific documents. What's awesome is that we've now been able to, uh, you know, shoehorn LaTeX into developing any kind of PDF document. So knowing it is half the battle won, in my opinion. Um, and then at the end of the day, all you have to do is put this together with some automation. Um, Circle CI is an option that you could go with. Um, what you really want is just some uh, system or some option, some product that can build your doc remotely. Um, it knows that it renders successfully and the outputs are available for remote access. Um, and actually, since I first wrote this or since I first uh, made this um, presentation, I've moved from Circle CI to GitHub Actions, um, and like and like I'm saying, like there are different products for automation and continuous integration. But you know, picking one is just you know that's totally up to you, um, as long as you have some sort of solution that does this. So here's the pipeline, and. <laughs> In my, in my perspective, you could either be a well-adjusted and organized human being who can update their resume, you know, periodically and keeps good habits, or you could over-engineer a complex solution to a problem that may not really exist. <laughs> that's what I've done here with this pipeline. And that's what I want to show you um, in a couple of slides. So in conclusion, is MS Word the worst tool in the world? No, it's not. Uh, it's, it's really not. And I hope that I've convinced you of that. Um, but I don't think that it's right for, re for building resumes and CVs for people who work with what we work with. Um, is literate programming or plain text a better alternative for everyone? No, actually, it's not. Um, because I, you know, I have a friend of mine who's a lawyer. And when I tried to talk to him about this problem, he said, do you want me to make one code document 
where I'm going to have to track changes for 40 different people who all have to sign something 60 different times. I think Microsoft Word is a better alternative for that. But for the purposes of what we're doing, I believe that there is um, a case to be made for moving away from um, Microsoft Word and moving into the programming. Um, was the presentation really necessary for us to learn this? Uh, probably not. <laughs> so it was mostly an airing of grievances. Yes. <laughs> and so um, what's important to um, appreciate here is that the first time I so like I wrote these slides was because of the scenario that I described at the beginning of this of the talk. The exact that similar scenario had just happened to me. Somebody had you know talked to me about a potential job and you know they said that the timeline was tight. Um, and after maybe a week after I didn't get that job um, and I had spent you know two hours, leaving other priorities because I thought that making a resume was, you know, that priority for that moment. Um, I ended up building these slides and presenting it at my former lab because we used to have a meeting called airing of grievances. Um, and that that's where this entire project came from. Um, and so do we get to see the results? Of course you do. Um, that's what the project club is all about. Um, so let's go into GitHub right now. And I, you know, obviously I exaggerated that the story, but that is something that did happen. Um, I was once out uh, with somebody and they said, you know, we might have a position for you, but you know, you gotta let me know as soon as possible. Um, by the time I was able to get home, ditch all of my other responsibilities and start working on my resume, what I thought was gonna be a five minute thing became a two hour thing because I didn't have Microsoft Word. And when I opened it up in Word, it was an old version. And when the old version broke, all the tables, you know, fell apart. So this project really is a pet project that developed out of uh, a very serious need and a very serious um, real scenario. And I hope that, you know, this presentation has, you know, demonstrated for you how you know, you can take real scenarios and build really cool projects out of them that solve actual problems. Um, so this is the RMD that um, that uh, parses the data that I use for my resume. There is a little bit of data at the top up here um, in the YAML header, if you're familiar with those. Um, I'm not gonna teach you how to write any of this code. Um, if you do want to learn about how the code works, and how to actually render it, you know, please let me know and I, I'm happy to walk you through it. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to go, you know, super high level. Um, so here's a little function called read subsheet, <clears throat> and it goes straight to that Google sheet here, right here. And uh, that's what reads, um, reads that data, um, reads each subsheet in here, and then saves it out into a little uh, list, right? And then to get my publications, because I'm uh, I'm an academic, um, I also want to include publications in my CV. So I just use this function, get publications uh, from the Scholar package. And this basically goes into Google Scholar, checks for any um, publications with this Scholar ID. This is my Scholar ID that I've signed up for with Google. Um, and then parses it out with all of this fun mutate and adds it to that all data list. So for each section of my CV, it's just a very simple, a little bit tidying. And then this detailed entries function. This detailed entries function comes uh, from the Vitae package and basically just asks you to say, uh, when were you doing something? What was it? Where were you with which institution and why? Where you can add a couple of details. Um, and you can do this for any section that you want. I've pulled this one education. I've called this one professional experience. I've called this one research experience. <clears throat> and you know, if ever you need to tinker with something, this is where you know your own expertise as an R user can come in handy because um, here I just wrote a quick function to, um, for example, take the uh, list of um, authors on a paper and write, and if, you know, I myself am not a first author on many papers, I'm only a first author on one, right? Um, but if I added all of the names of an author list until my name, it would probably take four or five lines in some of my publications. So 
sometimes uh, what you want to do is you want to uh, have like a minimum length of authors so that under the uh, the title, there's one, two, three, four names. And then I put a dot, 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 and then up until my name. So the max length of this list could be five, the minimum length could be four. Um, you know, just a little bit of, you know, uh, trickery, some some data munging trickery, um, which is what's great um, about R, right? The better you get at it, the more flexible you can be. And so you can see here, I've had a pub I've added a publication section with a first author and then a middle author section. And that first author section is really easy to find because it's like, uh, where is it? Yeah, just do a string starts or a string detect, easy. And you do the inverse of that for middle author. And I have software and project contributions where I just pluck that one sheet from the list, um, teaching experience, um, service experience, um, skills right here, and that's it. All of these are just detailed entries and then brief entries for uh, the uh, shorter sections. Um, so now that you have that, um, how do you get it to render? Of course, you can just render it you know, in our studio on your own, but obviously the better option is to automate it. And I automated it with Circle CI before, but now I automate it with um, GitHub Actions. I'll start actually with the uh, workflow. This render R markdown workflow is actually available from um, the RLib uh, GitHub Actions repo. Um, I barely had to modify it at all. I think the only things that I did was add um, one core library for OpenSSL. And then in here, just like you would do in R, um, in the uh, command line, you can just type R script minus E, R markdown colon colon render. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this, um, R Studio, uh, the button for render document is actually just a button that triggers this, if you've never seen that before. Um, and if you are curious about that, please, you know, take some time to like Google around, like what do the buttons in RStudio do? A lot of them, especially add-in buttons, just do this. They're just ex ex um, encapsulating some command that you could just do at the command line. Um, so in here, I render my long form CV detail. I also render a one page resume version. Um, and then in here, the, not, the last part of the GitHub action is to update um, like my github.io and also to commit the results that come out of this R markdown render. Uh, so I copy it, copy what I need. I git add anything that I need. And I make the uh, one page resume, this file, it renders out to a one page resume.html. So I move that and make it the index of my repo. Why do I do that? Because github.io, if you enable GitHub pages, it uses index.html as the home page of this repo. Um, and so I add that, I commit it with a nice little message that the github.io bot rebuilds the document, commits it, and pushes it. So in here, this is what that looks like. Runs in about three minutes, as you can see here. Um, and this is the one that we just rendered, by the way. Um, at the beginning of this uh, of this project of this presentation, and these are all the steps, right? So here is the render CV step, uh, where it just does run script minus e r markdown render, and here is the commit results se section that we just talked about, right? And because GitHub uh, was the one who rendered that document, here's the commit that uh, generated it. And like I mentioned, if you have github.io enabled with GitHub pages, this repository gets its own URL slash reproducible resume CV with your um, GitHub username. And you can actually just go to that website. And here I've rendered a one page resume as the home page of this repository. So now if anybody needs to see a resume from me, I can just send them to this website. Um, and you can get really creative with this if it's just an index.html. I think this one was built with page down. Yeah, this is the page down one. Um, 
where you know they actually have something fancy like a sidebar here um and i've used the sidebar to like you know type up a little widget for my github statistics right um i've also added a little button for whether or not this uh uh resume is passing the github actions um and you can see it's just a nice little one pager um the long form cv as you can see here i rebuilt my document 30 minutes ago that's one we just rendered and we can check to see if that uh service was added and yes it was 2022 to present member and mentor of our for data science community um and now if ever i actually need to update anything it's as easy as and you can do this in your phone's browser right or in your phone's github uh google sheets um you can just go in here oh man i gotta update a job type it in let it save Go to GitHub uh, in your phone's browser, go to the lost deployment, and then just hit rerun. And it does that all in the background for you. You don't have to worry about you know, getting to a laptop. You don't have to worry about um, sitting down and having quiet so that you can open your files. You don't have to worry about having our studio on your laptop running. You don't have to worry about whether or not your R Studio is up to date and whether or not running and rendering stuff will uh, break things because we're using um, GitHub Actions and we're using a basically containerized version controlled um, data and packages. So whatever you do, you change this input data, it's only going to reflect in here. It's not going to break anything. Um, and speaking of version control, if you think that you need another version, just make another version in your version control here and have GitHub Actions build that same um, build that same document, but with the different changes um, in a different branch. You could have a different branch for say, uh, professional versus, uh, industry versus academia, or you could have versions for creative uh, versus more stoic. Um, you know, the list goes on. It's all up to you. And as I mentioned at the beginning, like this is not, this is not me advertising that I've built a package that will solve all of your problems. Um, rather, this is me demonstrating that uh, with a little bit of um, creativity, um, you can find a really good solution that works for you um, to solve a very serious problem, which I think, um, you know, I wish I could start a revolution and have it so that we don't have to update resumes so much, but this is, this is as good as it's going to get for me. Um, so yeah, that's all that I have with 18 minutes to spare, it looks like. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Um, are there any questions or any discussion points that anybody wants to bring up? No, this is just really cool, but I, <laughs> I might make you cry if I tell you I maintain a version of my resume in Google Sheets and another one entirely in HTML for my website. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So I I think this is very cool. I missed do you have any um like auto triggers on this or do you only run the actions manually? That's a good question. Um yes, I do have uh automation triggers. So the automation triggers, if anybody's unfamiliar, um is what tells GitHub Actions to build something. Um and those are basically specified in the workflow document dot yaml and here's okay. what the trigger is <laughs> on push watches me and if you wanted um you could have a trigger for any um specific case for example you can you could ask it to only trigger whenever you change the cv the right. actual uh, cv the rmd um so yeah lots of options for that very cool yeah. i like the argument of using Google Sheets as a data, like as a database effectively, that there are cases yeah. where it just makes sense. You know, it's it's easy to work with, uh, easy to edit. Um, I did that with the R4DS uh, book club sign up thing that we did it as a Google Sheet, just as a hack to get it working. And then as we worked with it, I was like, you know, this is this is probably all we ever need for this. <laughs> like yeah. I was going to put a database on it and like, I don't, I don't think I want that. So. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> and, and what's great is that I can keep this, you know, I could, I could secure it if I wanted to under my, um, 
uh, under my uh, Google account, right? Like right. nobody's gonna have access to it that I don't want to have access to it. And you can keep everything in one sheet, basically. Um, all right. of the data that's used comes from one sheet. Um, and anytime, like I mentioned, as as long as you have an understanding of your um, your R markdown parsing, you can uh, you know do that. You can change this as as needed, right? This doesn't have to be. I've put this into a tidy format where it's like one row is um, a data point, right? And like multiple data points under nested underneath have blanks. Like you could do it however you want. You could um, have it in some other format, but like having a clean and parsable um, something that can come out, especially something that can come out in plain text, I think is where it all starts. Yep. Very cool. cool. <laughs> all right. Yeah, Any other questions? Awesome. I was just saying, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely gonna go <laughs> tinker in your um, like your repo and figure out how to do one of these from my on my own. Yeah, um, and you're totally welcome to fork my repo and you know do whatever you want with that. Um, and it, again, like I, I think I have the um, my I think I have my like who's responsible. Okay, yeah. So like. Um, this CV example, I think, is where I started. Yeah, Sam Abbott's. Um, and this was initially built for the Vitae package. Um, and just, you know, just going off of like his um, example, he has all of these as CSVs. And the uh, CLS file, like this is what actually does a lot of the styling that I talked about um fonts and here's the rmd so you know just like looking it up and just you know following other people's examples was where it really started um so you know i super encourage you to you know fork my repo you know break it see what uh you know what works for you what doesn't work for you and then also all of my um each of mine has the uh source that i use to generate it so yeah Super recommended. Thank you. All right. Well, that was uh, excellent. I loved I loved the uh, drama at the beginning. <laughs> Very nice. Um, You're welcome. So let's see. What is the plan? So that's it for this club. You know, we uh, we just do monthly. So that's it for this year. Uh, and then in January, uh, Lydia is going to be um, talking to us about, uh, is it still what's in the spreadsheet? Or did you decide to go to the other option? Potentially. Potentially. <laughs> so we'll okay. see. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Lydia will be talking to us about either this project she did or like other things related to it, I think was the idea. Um, and we'll see what that is in January, but it looks like we're gonna be doing some, uh, uh, well, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna give it away because I don't remember what this one is. Um, doing some actual like data analysis. Um, yeah, and we will uh, we'll meet then and I will see everyone then. That's January 14th. Uh, all right. And with that, I will see you all on the Slack. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Yeah, thank you.